Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Paul Richardson, and it's my pleasure to present um, on behalf of my colleagues um, some preliminary results from our dose expansion phase of the um, CC92480 MM001 study, where we evaluated the novel um, cerebron E3 ligase modulator, mesigdamide as it's called, um, which is a so-called cell mod in combination with dexamethasone in patients with relapse and refractory multiple myeloma. Now, just by way of introduction, um, MESI, as we like to call it, um, is a very potent orally bioavailable agent that has remarkable tumoricidal and immune stimulatory effects compared to other drugs that are broadly um, immunomodulatory, such as, for example, pomalidomide and lenalidomide. However, I think it's important to recognize that mesigdamide is different. Uh, Preclinical and translational data show this very clearly. And above all, as a pharmacologic activity, it's different in its structure, and it induces 100% closure of what we call the active cerebellum state, which is the key target. And in this slide, I try to show how um, this molecule binds in the E3 ligase complex, and by so doing leads to highly active and targeted degradation of key transcription factors that control the pathobiology of myeloma, including Icaros and Aelos, as these proteins are described. And this results not only in targeted programmed cell death in the myeloma cell, but above all in profound immune stimulation. And this is really quite important because it leads to the increased activity that we see. Now, in terms of the study, this composed of two parts, a phase one dose escalation, which we completed and established what we call a recommended phase two dose of one milligram given daily, three weeks on and one week off. And the phase two portion that we're going to focus on today um, describes the combination of mesigdamide with dexamethasone in a large cohort, over 100 patients um, with relapsed refractory disease. Now, in the first part of the study, we demonstrated that if you gave one milligram three weeks on, one week off with dexamethasone, we saw a response rate of 55%, which is very encouraging. But this was a relatively small number of patients, so we had to be careful and make sure, could this be reproducible um, in a larger cohort of patients? So with that in mind, the eligibility of the patients was they all had to have relapsed and refractory myeloma. They had to have three or more prior lines of therapy. And what was important to note is they had to be refractory to immunomodulators, proteasome inhibitors, and CD38 antibodies. And then above all, we allowed patients who had prior exposure um, to BCMA treatment. Now, this, I think, was an important cohort. Uh, in any event, the primary uh, intent was to establish the response rate and then to look at safety, tolerability, progression-free survival, uh, time to response and duration of response. And we also did an exploratory examination of what we call pharmacodynamics to better understand how the drug was actually working on tumor cells. Now, these are the baseline characteristics of the patients. 101 patients are enrolled overall. As you can see, slightly more men than, uh, than, than women. And importantly, the median age um, was 67, but we had a range from 42 all the way up to a patient aged 85. Importantly, about a third of patients had high risk cytogenetics, 37%. And interestingly, and very importantly, 40% had extramedullary disease. Now, in terms of prior therapy, about 30% had received prior BCMA treatment. All of the patients were relapsed and refractory, and all were triple class uh, refractory. This describes the uh, patient disposition and treatment exposure. And what you can see here is that few patients discontinued due to adverse events. And really, there was minimal related uh, treatment related mortality, in fact, only in one or two cases at most. Now, in that context, the mortality leading to treatment discontinuation is noteworthy for the following. We only had one patient pass from complications of COVID-19. And this, particularly as we were enrolling patients during um, the peak of the pandemic, uh, was an important and a favorable um, observation. Now, what about actual treatment-related adverse events? Well, the important thing to share here is that neutropenia was the most frequent hematologic uh, significant event. These proved manageable. Infections also did occur, but again, generally very manageable. And the amount of pneumonia we saw, approximately um, 13 cases um, of um, significant pneumonia, and only three that were considered potentially life-threatening. So this was an, an important signal because it's really relatively lower and then we see, for example, with some antibody-based approaches. Otherwise, the most important side effect noted was fatigue, but again, generally uh, manageable. Now, in terms of response rates, this is where the uh, response rate data landed. We saw 41% response rate overall. Importantly, in those patients with extramedullary disease, it was 30%. 
And then excitingly, in those patients who'd had prior anti-BCMA therapy, we saw a 50% response rate, which we thought was really quite encouraging, um, given the fact that those patients are particularly refractory. Now, what do we know about progression-free survival? Well, the data are very early, but so far, I think it's reasonable to say so good. The median progression-free survival is around uh, four and a half months. And if we look at duration of response, I think this is perhaps more informative. If you achieve very good partial response or better um, with early follow-up, we've got a median DOR of at least nine months. And if you achieve a PR or better, it's at least five months. So these data, again, are expected to continue to improve with time. Now, what about the pharmacodynamics? Well, this was a very uh, important part of the trial. What we sought to do was understand where levels of ALOS and Icaros might be uh, in patients prior to treatment and then during treatment, and specifically focusing on tumor ALOS, and especially grateful to patients for being willing to undergo serial bone marrow to establish this. We saw that patients who had received prior pomalidomide, for example, as their prior treatment, and in fact were refractory to it, very interestingly, we were able to show that with mesigdomide, you're able to restore that response, and it truly reflected an improvement um, in their effects of, of the effects of mesigdomide on the ALOS target. And you can see that summarized in this slide. And what you can see is that the ALOS uh, regimen, basic, or the ALOS staining in the slide on the left um, is very intense. And what you can see here is that when they receive the eight, the eight days of therapy, and this is markedly reduced. So showing that the mesigdomide is able to degrade the ALOS even after the pomalidomide um, has failed to do so. And then when we looked at this, in a more comprehensive factor, uh, fashion, looking at what we call peripheral blood immunophenotyping on the right of this slide, you can see that NK cells proliferating were active in the context of um, exposure to mesigdomide. T cells that were proliferating were active and increased. And what's so interesting as well is to see the preferential effects on both CD4 positive and CD8 positive cells. So in conclusion, mesigdomide clearly showed that it's the most potent novel cell mod that we have to date. Um, it clearly is very active in combination with dexamethasone and doing so in an incredibly vulnerable population. There's a manageable safety profile. And now we're evaluating this drug in combination with other standard treatments as part of larger phase one, two, and phase three studies. I just want to close by especially acknowledging our patients and families, as also the clinical study teams at all of the sites, uh, our sponsor, uh, Celgene, as part of Bristol Myers Squibb. And then similarly, just to acknowledge the international platform that this study is built on, incorporating countries not just from the United States, but also from the United Kingdom, Korea, Spain, Denmark, Finland, France, Greece, Canada, Belgium, and Australia. Thank you very much.